Hello, and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Broker, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. And we've got a great guest for you this week, Jessica Pierce. Uh, She's a first-time author, first published in April, so uh, we'll get the perspective of somebody coming in new and that she had a great launch. And she did a lot of things that most of us do not do as indie authors, especially first starting out. She's uh, very active on Instagram as she put together this big box of swag and I'm going to get her to give them more details on that. And uh, she's just got uh, experience in trad publishing too. So uh, let me just briefly read your bio, Jessica. She has traveled the entire span of the United States from the lush tropical volcanoes of Hawaii to the eerie romance of the Smoky Mountains. She is an alumna of Middle Tennessee State University where she studied English literature with a focus in adolescent fiction. Currently, she can be found in Arizona, not in the same cities as me and Jeff, but uh, down in Tucson with her Air Force husband, murderous devil cat, and three not so murderous goldfish. Uh, her first novel is called Atlas Fallen, and I'm actually going to ask you to tell us all about it, Jessica, and um, how you got into all this. Yeah, great. Um, so I have been writing for as long as I can remember. I'm sure everybody says that. And I started this book about four years ago and really it ended up being, as a lot of us do, it ended up being put on the back burner. Um, I decided that I needed to put up or shut up. So I finished it. And in the meantime, I knew I planted the seed of starting an audience about two years before the launch. So This was definitely something that I played the long game on, but I started a company that actually works with traditional publishers. I myself am am strictly indie, but I have worked with um, traditional publishing houses to promote new releases via book boxes. And if you've heard of uh, companies like Alcrate, or if you've heard of companies like Fairy Loot, which are huge in the YA community, um, it's exactly like that. And we at the time when I worked with the traditional publishing houses, we would choose a mystery novel, which we gave hints over so that um, teen readers kind of knew what they were buying and wouldn't get duplicate books. But we would choose a hardback novel that had been released in the last 45 days. And along with that, we would have the box um, under a certain theme. So it might be a, rebels and ball gowns or it might be we did one that was um i think rebels and rockets was actually the one that we did and it was like a sci-fi box and we did one that was uh we did we did one that was like sort of fantastic beasts that mythical beast dragons and and that sort of thing box um when beasts made of night came out which was a big one so in it we all do all the companies offer not only the hard book back book, but we also offer author interactions. There's usually either signed book plates or letters from the author. And we also include swag. So we recruit a lot of um, companies that might have dragon socks or something like that. And we put that in the box and it becomes this mystery Christmas box that arrives on their doorstep every month and they just go nuts for it. So it's very, very big. On Instagram especially it's very big in the YA community and then after two years of doing that I said hey I've learned a lot along the way I've also got kind of an audience set up for this so then I said uh, I wrote a book and luckily I had the support and an amazing customer base that said we're on board and they took it from there and the launch was just um, and in my view, it may not be, you know, a Harper Collins style launch, but in my view for an indie, it was, it was very good. It went very well. Okay. After the show, I'm going to need you to tell me where I get dragon socks because <laughs> I need some, obviously I don't have any, so that's important. But, um, so are these boxes, are they going out to like reviewers or like, who are the customers that receive the book and, and the box and everything? So a lot of, I've seen, Jillian Dodd especially has done this with her um, reviewers, and you can do that. You can send them to book bloggers and anyone else. Um, Instagram bloggers are really big about receiving a box in the mail, and it comes with, um, this time, when you do it for yourself, it comes more with 
very specialized swag that is your book only. It's not the greater theme. It's not related to multiple books. It's your swag. So it's really your opportunity to make your book shine and create a lot of fun stuff that then becomes kind of collectible. Um, but as far as customer base goes, my customers were actually my company customers who came in and, and bought it. So they actually paid for my launch. Um, that was my goal is I wanted to have a, an awesome launch and I didn't want to pay a dime for it, which are pretty lofty goals when no one knows that you're an author and no one knows your name as far as your book is concerned. And they actually paid uh, $29.99 plus shipping for the box. And then they got a hardback and, and we'll go into the kind of swag that they got. But they, uh, they paid for it. If you're doing it, doing it for bloggers, they kind of expect it to be a courtesy for free. So it just depends on what you, your goals are and, and what you want to do as far as financially. Yeah, it sounds really interesting. This is actually nothing I know anything about after whatever, we're <laughs> almost okay. 200 okay. episodes and uh, eight years and however long I've been publishing. Um, but I am curious before I ask you about your book, just what made you start this company? Like I would, I didn't even know this was a thing. Like, did you have a graphic design background or you were just aware of it and wanted to get into it? So I do not have a graphic design background, but in the last three years I've learned Photoshop, Illustrator, and in design. So I'm very much a, if I don't know how to do it, I'm going to learn how to do it. And that has proven very fruitful. On the other hand, I've also partnered with a lot of artists and things. I can't paint. I can't create cartoons or do character portraits. So I definitely outsource the things that I need to outsource. But as far as creating this is concerned, um, I left a job with the Red Cross and I decided to, my husband was kind enough to say, hey, you know what, You, if you don't right now, you're just going to find excuses not to. So let's quit your job and like, let's do this. In the meantime of, at first it was great. So I sat, you know, I was home and I was writing and it was a full-time thing. I wasn't making any money, but I was writing. And I felt like a writer, not an author, but a writer. So then Christmas came around and I realized I don't have any money for Christmas presents. And that, of course, being married, I just had this mental block of I wasn't an earner. I wasn't bringing in money. And that made me feel a lot of guilt. And I think a lot of stay-at-home spouses feel that sort of guilt. So that ate away at me until I decided, how do I make money and also prioritize the writing in a way that I'm playing the long game and I, I can build my audience while I'm still staying at home and doing this sort of thing. So the company that I started ended up being the perfect solution to that. I made a lot of connections, um, a lot of great friends in the bookstagram community. So that has been invaluable to how successful the book went in April. Awesome. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit too, is it YA sci-fi, I believe? I, I looked at the blurb and I was like, oh, this sounds right yes. up my alley. <laughs> so it's YA sci-fi and it is about a young girl who had dreams of being a pilot and she lost those dreams because her father was convicted and executed for treason. So she's been banished to the space station slums, which is she, her family worked all her life to get her out of. So it's a huge step back for her. Um, it's very gang riddled. There's a lot of crime syndicates. Uh, there are actually robot cage matches in the, in the book. So there's a lot of, you know, tech sort of battles and she's determined um, to get out. But right now at the, at the start of the book, she owes a very large debt to the biggest crime boss in the slums. So, she knows she has to escape or else she's going to die. Basically she's going to, they're eventually going to get to her. So um, she meets this very mysterious boy and I won't give anything away, but she meets a mysterious boy with the power to wipe her slate clean and sort of get her down to earth in exchange for, he needs her access to the station to hunt a terrorist on the loose. And through a series of events, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, a, a very diverse, quirky cast. 
um, there's a lot of secrets that come out from both their lives that end up really causing a lot of friction because they realize that they come from completely different worlds. Um, and then, of course, you've got just this mad, completely mass murderer on the loose, which always adds a little, a little tension to any plot. But it's been a really fun read. A lot of uh, readers have said that it's very like Cinderella meets Divergent or sort of an action-packed thing. There are some fairy tale sort of undertones. So it's, it's been really, there's been a lot of crossover as far as what's popular right now on shelves and, and sort of what I wove into the book, hopefully. So. It's a lot going on in that book. That sounds yeah. pretty deep. Um, all right. So in your, in your intro, uh, it mentioned that uh, you actually studied adolescent fiction, right? Yes, I did. Uh, yeah. There's frequent talk uh, uh, about how YA doesn't often get the respect that more, more literary genres get. Yes. Um, what sort of discussion goes on regarding it? Like, like what, do you, what do you learn about when you study adolescent fiction? Well, um, you learn a lot, especially about banned books and how banned books, they really reflect a lot of the morality of a time. And you can measure the changes socially in a culture, not only about what's written, but about what's banned. And so we did a lot of like social commentary about adolescent fiction. And today you'll see that younger readers and um, books that skew younger are really some of the more progressive books as far as it comes to representation, as far as it comes to especially um, gay and lesbian and bisexual uh, characters. I mean, it's, they're really making a push for visibility. And I think that's, that's really overlooked a lot of the time. You know, a lot of people say, oh, it's for kids. It doesn't matter. But how many of us can remember that book from our childhood that really shaped who we are? And if we wait until those books are available when a person's an, an adult, we're missing a lot of formative years. So you're really underestimating just how powerful uh, adolescent fiction and, and middle grade fiction are. So oh, yeah. that's when your brain is most absorbent, you know? Exactly. Uh, yeah. So as like, you know, with this sort of background and education and knowing all of this, did that sort of inform your own process when you were writing? I think so. Um, I, actually have a notebook that I kept where it, it's kind of just topics that I, I kept over a long period of time during those years that I said, okay, I'm interested in this right now, or I'm having trouble with this right now. So I've kind of tried to keep up with that and moving it into uh, the plot. And there are a lot of moments in the book where I was personally bullied as a kid. So feeling other and feeling less than and um, I grew up in a family that didn't have a lot of money. So a lot of those experiences and a lot of that sort of guilt and pressure and shame really comes through in this book with uh, the main character, Tesla, who definitely has always been made to feel less than. So. Yeah, I just wanted to mention to you real quick, when you're describing all the different characters, the type of situations, I just envision your workspace is like little, little yarns, like one leading here to there and all kinds of stick notes and everything. I was like, that's got to be interesting to keep in tr you know, keep track of everything there. But It is. Yeah, it is all these color-coded <laughs> three-by-five cards <laughs> that get laid out in patterns, and it looks like sort of a weird patchwork quilt of a maniac. <laughs> Okay, so for those listeners and, uh, and viewers who might be considering trying their hand at young adult science fiction, what would you say are some common tropes that should be addressed? I think some of the more interesting ones, it's not in my book, but it's, it's an, a trope that's coming out is the idea of social media and how in a futuristic world social media will affect characters. And in my next series, that's actually one of the biggest things that um, – basically helps them be selected for a certain position. So I like seeing how modern, sort of like Black Mirror, if you watch that, how modern things in our world, if you put them under a microscope and you look at that technology and you say, this is great now, what if somebody abuses it? So the, the abuse of technology, I think, is really interesting. Um, I would say that 
a lot of readers expect some sort of romantic subplot nowadays. So that's something if you are writing to market, you might want to think about. And definitely, of course, the big one is, you know, fight the power, fight the man. And, and that's always, I think, going to echo in the hearts of some readers. So that's definitely something in my book. But um, yeah, there's love triangles. I think Hunger Games really started a lot with, with love triangles that readers just really latched onto and, and found appealing. So I've noticed that there's a lot of sort of um, a boy from one station, a social station, and a boy from another social station and how they compare and character foiling those. And so I think those are some tropes um, that I find interesting personally. So. We've had a, a few authors on doing well in YA fiction, but a lot of people saying that it's a tough sell, that it, it's kind of hard, especially it's an indie author doing eBooks because your audience doesn't have credit cards, so they're not shopping on Amazon. Uh, a lot of people have said that they end up with mostly adult readers who maybe then hand the books to their teenagers. Do you know, have you been at managed to reach the teenage audience or, or yeah, how are you reaching the teenage audience if you are? <laughs> oh, I, actually am very lucky that I have direct contact with a lot of the people who bought my launch box. So I can actually tell you the demographics and the demographics are out of all the launch boxes I sold, I sold one to a male, the rest were females and they were all between the ages of 20 and about 55. So I, I mean, I have readers that are in the fifties and give it to their children. And I have readers in the thirties that are really starting to introduce their you know, they're very younger kids to the idea of books and that's going to travel down the road eventually. So yeah, it's definitely women right now for me at least. And it's, uh, it's definitely adults. I haven't really cracked the teen market. I think that's going to be easier in person at like conventions or if I do like a book con, I think that's going to go really well. But right now it's very adult readers who like me enjoy escaping into um, YA fiction and, and reading about, you know, things that are a little bit younger. So now when you were, when you were like preparing, you know, you had a long view on your, on your launch, when you're preparing for your launch, were you expecting that to be the case? Like, was that your, your, your expected audience? Yes. So I had, um, I had that demographic data from my company for a while. So I, I really had a lot of, insight to play with. Um, so that really helped knowing that, for instance, men don't buy my boxes. I noticed that a lot of book boxes keep their swag more gender neutral. But if I know women are buying my boxes, I'm going to do swag for women. And that's not, and I don't want to get into the whole women like certain things and men can't like certain things. That's not it. But I know that my readers particularly love to get jewelry. So I did a set of earrings for the box that were custom. And knowing that sort of information really tailors the experience and the investment in that wow factor when they open the box that they remember when they get ready to dig in the book. I love the box. I'm sure I'm going to love the book kind of echoes in their brain. So I, I really wanted to keep that there. Now, did you, uh, like, obviously not everybody who, who is uh, going to be watching this episode is going to be putting together a launch box, but, like, the things that everyone will have, like a blurb or anything like that, did you, did you craft those similarly with sort of targeting toward the expected audience? That was actually a mistake I made, and I'm all for talking about my mistakes as well as my successes because I think that's important. I didn't, it didn't occur to me when I was writing my first blurb to put a lot of attention on the romance. Because in my head, I was like, readers are expecting that I can talk about the action and adventure side of it um, and give a little bit more world building details and kind of really make that hook crisp. And then I realized that I also did something different in that I didn't have people on my cover, which in the indie world, they always tell you rule one is you need to have people on your cover. And I actually went the polar opposite of that and I can actually show you here. Um, I, it's just abstract graphics on this. There's no people. There's no hint at romance on the cover. Super so, professional, though. Like, if people watch the video, it is a super professional cover. 
I made this for $10. So I'm very <laughs> happy with it. But um, that was a big thing that readers, I was getting great reviews, but they, was, they said I wasn't expecting the romance. And they're like, I'm glad it was in there, but I just didn't know it was coming. So that was a way that I, I had to look at the feedback and really evaluate, wow, I need to make this clear because they're right. There's nothing about a black and white cover or a blurb that doesn't mention a relationship that says, hey, readers who love science fiction romance, get ready because it's in there. And that kind of ties into my question here because my question is, how was your first book launch and is there anything you wish you would have done differently? Yes. <laughs> yes. There's a lot I wish I would have done differently, um, especially with the swag. There, one of the things I did with uh, the launch box is I wanted to have the swag then, but I also wanted the swag to be available later. And I did the launch box, it went great. But when I offered those pre-order swag packs um, that I offered to my customers that they could send in a receipt and they got a little envelope in the mail filled with um, some different things that I'll go into in, in a bit. But the swag that I bought for the box was a different size than the envelope. So just really being aware of not having to, to print twice, which was expensive. So there were some, imagine. <laughs> yes, there were some things that I could have done as far as being more present at, in the, in the plan, in the big plan, the big picture. Um, I also did not give myself, and this is completely on me. I did not give myself enough lead time to get a proper, um, proof done through Ingram. And when I got my, I did get a proof, but when I got it, it was a little bit off center and, and it was enough that it was very noticeable. So I actually had to delay this, the shipping of the launch boxes by two weeks because I had to redo the proof. And I, I, everything had been going so well that I got a little cocky and I was like, oh, I got this. Everything's, you know, it's smooth like velvet. Nothing's going to go wrong. And yeah, then it's, it went it's wrong. One of those, it's one of those things like, okay, it's a, it's a teeny tiny little quirk on the cover. Most people are probably like, oh, yeah, it's fine. You and yeah. the, the creator going, son of a bleep, bleep, yes. bleep. That, that's not going to work for me. Yes. I was like, they're going to think I made this cross-eyed and in the dark because it looks terrible. And of course, in the grand scheme of things, Nobody cared, but I cared. So, um, yeah, so that's another thing that went wrong with the launch. And other, other than that, it was pretty decent. It was pretty good. I learned a lot. I didn't expect it to be perfect because it was the first time doing it. But overall, I, I would make a lot of the same decisions again. So I think, I, I think that's good. All right. It's interesting what you were talking about with the blurb, because I think a lot of us that write, that have both male and female readers, that write stuff that could appeal to both sides, because I do sci-fi too, and there's usually a love story, but there's also a lot of action and adventure, and I get a lot of guys reading it. It's kind of hard to decide with your blurb, like who am I really trying to target? And yeah. we've had folks on that said what you were saying, the women will want the character driven blurb. And if there's a romance, often they're interested in it. Whereas the guys may not want to like mm -hmm. hear about the romance and maybe more like, tell me about the world and the tech. Um, it, it's, I don't know. I have a suggestion for folks other than what I've done is, and you might do later if you make a big series and have a box set, I've done like a different blurb on the book one. Then I put on like the three book box set trying to target the different half <laughs> So, and I've heard, we had folks on that did the Amazon ads and stuff and they've written them where some of the ads, they target women and, and write the copy one way and some of the ads, they target men and write it the other way. Yeah. At the 20 books conference last year, um, they actually talked about targeting the different types of ads that targeted the different demographics and genders. And I, th I thought that was really interesting because it's not something I had really ever thought about before, but I definitely noticed that I... I am writing for women. So all of my marketing, my blurb, my covers, everything I do from now on is really going to be geared towards women. Cause I know that those are my big buyers. If a guy hops on more power to him, he can, you know, he can join the newsletter list. He's going to get all the same stuff and that's going to be great. But my, really my, my bread and butter is going to be women. So I'm going to really cater to what they're looking for from now on, at least for the next little while until I write something different. So. 
Yeah, that sounds great. And I think especially in sci-fi, women often are looking for their books because there's all this military sci-fi and space opera with the guy captain, you know, and, you know, I think it can be hard to find what you're looking for. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's a great audience to target. I jokingly call my book a space opera. I wouldn't really call it that, but there actually is an opera in space in my book. So it's kind of a little joke though. It sounds nerd, nerd for me. <laughs> yeah, a lot of those categories on Amazon, you're like, well, they're in space for three chapters. They're spaceships. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so I, I did want to ask a little more since you know so much about like the swag and creating the launch boxes. If I, as an author, maybe doing a new series or if a new author wanted to try the same thing, um, how would you get started? You mentioned that there's companies, like, can I pay someone to just like make cool stuff that I can send out to ARC readers or reviewers? Yeah, so um, I don't know of any company, and it's funny because a lot of people have approached me to actually sort of spearhead this idea, and I do see a lot of demand, and it's a conversation that my family's having um, about managing this for other authors because I love it so much, and Right now, there's not someone who can compile this box and send it out to you. You could always outsource it to a personal assistant. I know of one right now who is doing that for an author. And that's an option. But overall, the margins on a box like this are going to be pretty slim. And that's just going to be the complete honest truth. Any subscription box out there, whether it's a makeup box or a, a beef jerky box or whatever you're into, the margins are pretty slim once you get through all of the stuff that you want to include. So it's something that until you really get the volume to justify somebody doing it for you, you might be better off doing it yourself. But that's just, that's my take. I mean, there are authors who, who outsource it. So Right. I imagine if you had got to the point where maybe you've written a couple of series and have a pretty big following and you know you have X amount of money to spend on this stuff, yeah. then you could jump into that. Um, and you mentioned before we started recording that there's some YouTube channels. Is that right? That could teach me how to make this swag. So everything that I will show today, I learned on YouTube. And I know that that probably makes me sound like, I don't know. I'm not, it's, it's not a lot coming out of this brain right here. It's a lot of YouTube in this brain. So I just adapted it. There was one, um, and I'll show this one, which is, this was a big ticket item in the launch box that I did. Not in this fabric. This is actually a Game of Thrones fabric that I did for my husband. But I did a book sleeve. So I don't know if you've ever seen the book sleeves. All they are, they're just giant pockets for books. That's all they are. And the tutorial that I used was actually a phone protector. So I sewed these myself and that comes into the biggest thing that I tell authors is play to your strengths. If you're a sewer, you can do sewing swag. If you're a painter, you can do painting swag. If you, um, I make candles. So I did candles in my box and it really depends on what you, what talents you have. And then when it reaches the point where you don't have that talent anymore, outsource. So this, it's just super easy to make and it doesn't cost very much, but they're highly, highly, highly in demand on Instagram. So that was a way for me to just add that a little bit of wow factor into the launch box. But it's all YouTube. <laughs> That's all right. I've learned a lot from podcasts and YouTube and such. We're on YouTube. So obviously it's a good place to get yeah. information. <laughs> uh, the book, That's cool. The book cozy or what did you call it? book sleeve. <laughs> so they're called book sleeves. My shop that I have actually calls them story snugs just because I love alliteration. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, so I good. call them and I had um right here I had a custom Atlas Fallen uh fabric tag that was sewn in. So it had the little circle from the cover right here. It had that on there and then it said exclusive um story snug on it. So just that little extra detail in the box that makes a reader feel that they, A, they got their money's worth, which is always the goal. You always want to make sure that they feel fulfilled and like they got their money's worth. And B, anytime they use that, they're also reminded, hey, that's an atlas. I wonder what Jess Pierce is doing lately. I wonder, I haven't checked on her blog. I haven't checked on her, 
you know, website, not that I have a blog, that's a step I haven't gotten to, but you know, you get the idea that I, it's, you're more present on their bookshelf, which is, which is good. And it, it seems like it's neat to have somebody doing something besides just bookmarks and like the, the book plates. Not that there's anything wrong with those. Those are handy. Yeah. Um, and it, it also seems like outside of the launch, you could also, you know, I know authors are often, what should I post on my Facebook page? You know, especially if you're maybe only doing a book a year, you know, which is pretty standard in, in traditional publishing, right? It, it can be hard to like always come up with something relevant for your people in, in your newsletters. Yeah. So if you could be like, hey, I made, I have three of these uh, book sleeves with my cool dragon logo on it and yep. I'm giving them away and it's like something you can, I, I know Joe, uh, he does some stuff with swag and, and he, he's had a lot of uh, art design. So he's always got stuff to share on those platforms. All right, but let's get a little bit into Instagram because I, okay. I told you that <laughs> you were requested by a listener that <laughs> heard how pathetic we all are at Instagram in that we've not tried it at all. So could you maybe give us an overview on like what authors can do on Instagram? And I've heard that this is like a big thing with the YA audience. So I imagine yes. that that's useful. So Instagram goes hand in hand with Bookstagram and Bookstagram is actually the name that this community of readers and there are hundreds of thousands of YA readers, if not more, on this, um, in this, within this community on, on Instagram. And you can find them if you just go to Instagram.com and you search for hashtag Bookstagram, you will see what this community does. And the whole idea of this community is that they take covers, they take, sorry, they take pictures of covers of books and they do it in a way that is a very, photogenic aesthetic. Sometimes they use props, sometimes they use flowers, sometimes they use um, things that you'll find in the book like maps or, or uh, daggers or things like that and they cultivate a photo around this book. So it's a very interesting and very talented group of people and I'm constantly blown away by the sheer amount of time and passion that goes into this. Well, I know being a, a person that relies on customers to let make their business grow, I know that I have to go where my customers and my readers are getting their information. And I can tell you for young adult authors, the number one place is Instagram right now, that it's completely hot, it's unstoppable. And you, I don't pay for marketing. So that's another thing I should say. I don't do AMS ads. I don't do Facebook ads. I only advertise through Instagram and the, the swag business that I did, it went from $5 in sales basically one year to $80,000 annual sales within a, a matter of months. So Instagram I think is a really underrated tool. The caveat to this is that I don't have a lot of experience as far as adult genres and how that crossover will, will would work because Instagram really is Bookstagram, at least, belongs to young adult readers. They're, that's their turf. So um, that's where I went when I started all this. I, I went there and, and really started pitching and, and feeling out what the demand was in the market and what the needs were. And then I made a product to match. So. All right. Uh, I got a couple of questions now regarding okay. this. Yeah. First, uh, we're talking bookstagram and they're taking photos of covers. So this is inherently like a, uh, a physical edition of the book, right? Yes, that is a challenge. So um, the bookstagram community, they, some people do uh, color Kindles and that's becoming more popular, but really the roots are very steeped in physical copies. So that is why People told me not to do a hardback, but I, I really pushed back against that idea because I know my market, I know my readers, I know my customers, and I know that if I launch a box and it doesn't have a hardcover in it, they're not going to go for it. I'm not going to hook them. So I really needed to, to get that out there. So I did a hardcover. Well, yeah, I've definitely had quite a few of my readers request hardcover editions, which I have not provided yet. So <laughs> now I know what sort of person is asking for them. But uh, the other thing is, um, 
So is Instagram mostly a way to just engage and, and, uh, and reach readers or like you said, you know, you know, you went from a certain number of sales to a much, much larger number of sales. Yes. Like is there direct advertising or is this just sort of drumming up interest and excitement? Your power as a, as a bookstagram user lies in hashtags. And you can go in and even when you start to type something, you can start to type hashtag books and it'll tell you in the pop-up how many posts have been made with that hashtag as you're typing it into your phone. You can only post through your phone, at least right now, unless you do a third party, party posting app, which I don't do. But um, when you go to type it into your phone, it's gonna tell you auto-populate which hashtags are more popular in the spelling that you currently have. And you really have to spend some time in the weeds kind of going through these posts and looking at the hashtags of the more popular posters and seeing what are they using that these readers already conditioned to type in to look for. So bookstagram is one of them, hashtag bookstagram, hashtag books, um, hashtag reading, hashtag book dragon, hashtag shelfie. I'm sure that there are gonna be some listeners furiously writing these down, but um, hashtag Goodreads is another one, Goodreads challenge. So you, it, you really have to uh, go on there and spend some time digging through these posts, but I don't pay any money at all for marketing right now. I pay $0. I reach a lot of readers um, just through hashtags you really need to, another part of this is the algorithm. It's a lot like Facebook. It's a lot, I think, like Amazon, where the more popular you are, the more you set up signals for this mystery computer to pick you up. And a way that you can do that on Instagram is by building a tribe of bookstagrammers, dedicated bookstagrammers that are in your close circle. You can do a group chat of, I think, up to 20. Anytime you post, they go on there and they say, oh, cool picture, or, oh, that's a great post, or oh, I love this book. And you're getting that social proof in every single one of those interactions that's going to just pump you into this computer and really make you visible. So hashtags are great, but you really need to think about having that, that small social tribe that can kind of, um, your, your hype ladies, your hype men, that can get behind you and really make that post um, visible. Which leads beautifully to my next question. I'm so good at this. <laughs> yeah, aren't you? As with, as, um, I have actually wrote down on here, as with many social platforms, Instagram is all about how many people are following you. Yes. So what do you typically do to try and get more followers? Uh, giveaways are great. So I, there is a very detailed, and this is going to be kind of a longer answer, and I know I'm kind of long-winded as it is, but here's what you want to do. You want to spread your post like a cold. You want to spread your book like a cold. And this is what I try to tell everybody. Like a you cold, are, I'm going to remember that. <laughs> you want to be the cold and you want to make everybody have the sniffles. So what you want to do is you want to make stipulations on your giveaway. It does, if you just do a giveaway and say, oh, I'm just going to pick one person that comments below. That's great. That's not optimal. So what you really want to do is you want to say, and, and the, Keep in mind that bookstagrammers are really conditioned to knowing these rules because pretty much across the board, companies have these. It's not something new to them. It might seem a little detailed to people who aren't used to it. But anyways, back to that. You want to say, hey, to win this competition, you've got to follow me on Instagram. That's your number one thing because you're building a, an Instagram newsletter, basically. So you want to say, you've got to follow me. You've got to comment below because you're getting that social proof and you, the comment really ideally should be, you can tag three people below for, um, you know, extra entries and you got to keep up with it. So be prepared to spend some time doing this. You got to use this. You got to repost it to your own, uh, Instagram page because now you're spreading that cold to everyone that views their page and so that those posts don't get lost in the giant void that is the internet. You have to have a custom hashtag for that giveaway specifically so that when you go on there to look at entries, you can type in that hashtag and look to see who has entered and followed the rules. So just quick recap, 
follow me. So I'm getting a follower. You want to repost to your page so that your followers see it. Use my hashtag and then comment below and tag a person because that tag is going to alert the next person who's then going to repost to their group of people who are then going to, it's just the cycle. So that cold becomes this massive plague. Pneumonia. <laughs> yes, pneumonia, you know. But um, yeah, so that's the idea is you really want to, to give everybody the sniffle, the social sniffles, we'll say that. So I've seen this kind of thing done on the other platforms too. Um, do you feel that it has to be like a pretty good prize in order to get people willing to, you know, like do all these things and, and tag everybody, or I guess maybe teens are less jaded. Oh, I don't know if that's true, but um, maybe more likely to go along with it to get stuff since they don't have money to buy stuff. <laughs> exactly. I think you hit the nail on the head. Okay. <laughs> uh, teens are broke. I know yeah. I was. Teens are broke. So they hear a free signed copy. You're, you're also opening up a chance for, these new readers who, when you, especially when you give away books, these readers who can't afford to invest in your series right now, but really love it. It's, I see it as a review chance. So I'm doing a giveaway. I was already going to do a giveaway, but now it's an opportunity really for me to try to cultivate a review, an ARC member potentially. So I look beyond just the, it's a freebie thing. And the big thing that I want to tell authors is, Bookstagram is not buy my book. You definitely have to put in the time of commenting on people's cat videos and commenting on people's, you know, when they get a new book haul is, is a thing at the end of the month, they'll show all the books they bought that month and really commenting and saying, Hey, I loved this book, but thanks for the recommendation for this. So you really have to be genuine. I mean, you're there for books because you love them as well. So you can spend a lot of time. But on the flip side, a lot of people spend tons of time on AMS. A lot of people spend tons of time on Facebook ads. So it's just reallocating that time that I would spend there to a different social media platform. Right. And I think it's pretty typical, like when you're getting started, you're either going to have to spend time or you're going to have to spend money. Like if you have money to yeah. throw at ads, maybe you can kind of shortcut yeah. and not spend as much time building a platform. But if you yeah. don't, or if you just, you know, some people love it too. They're just like, oh my gosh, I love Facebook. That's the natural thing for them to establish a platform there mm -hmm. but it is probably going to be one or the other that you, know, you have to yeah, exactly. put money or time in um, so for the contest these this is all kind of photo based right like you take a picture on your phone and then you upload it with everything are you using like your book cover or so i can um that's a great point uh to make right now is I also want the cover to get out there. I've had a number of people who have ended up on my newsletter list that say, oh my gosh, I saw this book on Instagram. People are talking about this book all over Instagram. So that was the ultimate goal is I wanted this sort of uh, chatter to start and to really feed off this chatter. And um, yeah, that's that's been great as far as that goes, but I lost my train of thought just now <laughs> oh no it's i was okay. just wondering because it's uh photo based and i think a lot oh, of us okay, like, you yeah. can only post your cover so many times right so yes what are you putting up there <laughs> so i do um and that's going to lead into we're going to actually have a chance to double team this answer because we'll talk about a swag item that's really popular that gives you something else to put in your pictures that's not just your book because you're right. People are like, oh, okay, you've posted your last 10 pictures about your book. Again, you're a writer. So I had art made of my characters. So I've got this very um, painted to market, if you will, couple photo. And for those of you listening to the podcast, you might want to check it out on YouTube because there's physical examples in this one. But I did that. And then I had this gorgeous um, photo done of Tesla. Oh yeah, that one's really cool. And I sent these out so people can take photos of these. They can take photos of the book. I can take photos of these and spread them around. And bonus, because I always like connecting my colorful yarn strings, Jeff, I, um, I used artists that are already popular in the Instagram, bookstagram community. So these artists are known to readers 
And that just gave another layer, another dimension to, hey, I've got swag that you want. So. Oh, that's a, a great tip right there because I imagine they have their own followings on Instagram yes, and so exactly. they so do I'm, something for your book, they're going to kind of pimp your book as they show off their artwork. Yes. I'm, I'm sniffling everybody. Everybody's getting sniffles. So it's, it's really, it's really widening that web as much as possible by using connections that relate to the market that you're looking for. And did you just find those folks because you're there and you're aware of them because you've come across them as you're surfing it? Or did you, do you have any tips for authors that are thinking, Oh, I want to yeah. give this a try? <laughs> yep. I would say uh, follow, if you're a YA author, you need to be following the book boxes because the book boxes make their money on swag. So you're going to not only get new creative ideas, but you're also going to see when they tag their partners that they've worked with in the post, you're going to see the name of that designer. You're going to see the name of that artist and you're going to get to go follow them or bookmark them and say, I love that style. They were really popular in the fairy loot. They are really popular in the owl crate. I'm going to go use that artist. And that's exactly what I did. I piggybacked. I'm not going to lie about it. I piggybacked. No, I love that tip because I've actually started doing some character portraits for my next series and I've just grabbed folks off a of deviant art who were looking for work, which is perfectly fine. But uh, yeah. yeah, I love the idea of that because I have no idea. Some of them probably have Instagram, but I'll, I will have to go check it out. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right, my last question on Instagram. <laughs> oh, your no, I, yeah, you're not, don't, don't even worry. Like, All right, we can just a, you mentioned that you don't pay anything for marketing, but is there an option like on Twitter and Facebook? We don't know how effective they are necessarily, especially those Twitter ads, but if people want to buy ads on Instagram, can they? Yes, so I believe that if you go through your Facebook ads, when you look at your um, markets, like where you want it to post, Instagram is an option because Facebook owns Instagram. So they're connected. So they always recommend when you're running Facebook ads to deselect Instagram. And that goes along with the lines that a lot of these tips are not rent written by YA authors. So as an adult, a writer of adult science fiction or a writer of adult romance or, you know, insert whatever, Instagram may not be the optimal place for you to promote. And that's, that's a big maybe. I haven't tried it. I don't know. Do it for yourself. See what happens. Get back to me with the results because I would love to look at that data. But overall, um, I think you can actually set up Instagram only ads through Facebook. It's something that I would have to look at. And then you can also boost posts directly through your Facebook um, or excuse me, through your Instagram app, it gives you the options. Once you reach a certain follower limit, you get to upgrade to a business account, which really gives, and it's free. And it really gives you a lot of that insight as far as demographics, uh, busiest times of day, which is a huge benefit when you're posting and you know, okay, I have, you know, 3000 eyes on my page at this given time. I'm going to aim to promote during that time, of course. So, um, there are Instagram specific ads. I have heard from someone in the 20 books group. I cannot remember his name. I think it's Jose. I'd have to look up his last name, but he's phenomenal with Instagram. Just blows me out of the water. And he says that the post should look like a bookstagram post. So not the whole book cover and it's buy my book and there's ad copy on it. You don't want that you want it to look more as if you are a, an organic reader posting about that book, if that makes sense. Yeah, we've had a couple of folks on that mentioned also for the Facebook ads to get stock art or something instead of just using your book and, uh, you know, yes. find a cool dragon or a spaceship or something. Which back. goes along to the next comment that I was going to make is all of this artwork that I did, I had them send me the, just the PNG of the characters. I actually put this background behind this art. So I have all of these with a transparent background. When you get swag, again, thinking about the long game of, okay, it can go in your swag box. It can go in a pre-order envelope. Now you've also got, I can put this on my website. I can put this in my newsletters. I can put this on my ad copy. I have this resource, resource for life. 
So I can really get a lot of mileage out of something like that. And knowing that you can take an image and repurpose it for other things. My, by far, when I did Facebook ads for like two weeks, maybe, by far my most popular post was the one with this couple. By far. So. You know, it's this is funny because uh, regular viewers of the show will know that this cabinet over my shoulder here is completely filled with uh, attempts at swag and assorted artwork. And now it's like, well, here's a gold mine that I could have been using on a thing that's used specifically for sharing images. So I'm going to have to try to, I have a, I have a, a Instagram account. I may have posted seven times, so I'm going to mm -hmm. have to get good at that. Uh, so I have one quick question before we move on to the sure. next set of questions here. And it has to do with, um, you're talking about giveaways, right? The number of, uh, uh, like how should it be a big giveaway? Like we're giving away 50 things or like, is it better to, to, uh, do small giveaways more frequently? Like what's the scale and size of this stuff? So I would say to mix it up, I would say one time to do a, just to show you this box that I have, um, it's printed all the way around. It's custom printed and it's made to look like a book. It's got book pages, parchment-y stuff. This isn't the box I used for Atlas, but it's an example of one that I've used in the past. So doing a one-time giveaway of the custom box that's left over from the, the launch box. Um, and you can fill it full of new stuff. So you can just keep the shipping box itself and then do a new giveaway for readers that have already bought the launch box that want new stuff or um, readers that just haven't, didn't have a chance to snag one. I, I sold out um, three different times. So a lot of readers missed out and I got those emails of, hey, can I get the one? And I, I was all out of shipping boxes. I eventually had to just ship in cardboard boxes that were super plain. And I felt terrible, but I had to ask them beforehand because the boxes are so coveted for those bookstagram photos. So if you run out of boxes, be sure to check because part of what they're paying for is they want that box, which is so weird because it's a shipping box, but they love it. Um, People are weird. <laughs> so I would do one big box like that. And then I would also do those smaller giveaways of say uh, the signed book plate and the artwork and some buttons. One of the most collectible things on, on bookstagram right now are magnetic bookmarks. I don't know if you guys have ever seen these. So let me pull one out of this little sleeve real quick. And they are my characters. So again, I outsource this. I have a wonderful um, illustrator that I partner with regularly. He charges $15 per character. Super affordable. Swag is not out of reach. I think a lot of authors think creative swag is out of reach. It is not, I promise you. So if you see, I've got this branded card. Again, I'm, everything's branding. Everything's that author brand. Everything is that. And when they see this symbol, they don't even have to read Atlas Fallen. They can see it and say, Jessica Pierce. I know that's Jessica Pierce. So if you look, those are my two main characters. You got Tesla and you got Daxton. And these are printed on photo paper with little magnets in the middle. And they snap together over your page. And now you've got a, a bookmark, which is expected, but it's a spicier bookmark. There's a little more to it. And people don't even use these as bookmarks. They actually put twine on their bookcases and they collect them. <laughs> and they put, I mean, it's insane, but it's great. I love it. But it's just that, again, digging into bookstagram and really seeing what the, what the readers are into and then delivering. So that was an easy way for me to blow them out of the water. And I actually have the whole cast right here. And that's a great thing for a giveaway because these cost me, I think $1.30 to make, but I give them away. They're worth, these sell on Etsy for about $10, 10 to, $10 to $13 for an entire set. So there's a huge profit margin on it. It's a great premium item to put. Um, and it's lightweight. So when I do a giveaway, I can ship that in the continental United States for about $2 and 70 cents. All right. So let me ask you with regards to Instagram, is the platform something you think all authors should be a part of, or do you feel it only should work for authors of a specific genre? So 
I have seen, there are readers on there as far as graphic novel readers. That, that's a market that I haven't even remotely touched yet. There are, romance is pretty popular on there. There's a lot of bookstagram um, YA readers who also cross over into sweet adult romance. You're not going to see a lot of readers post about spicy erotica just because they're post they're also posting about YA and I think there's that audience crossover in the same way that if you had a pen name you wouldn't you know you probably wouldn't publish both under the same pen name so I do think that it caters more towards YA but you can get away with um epic fantasy I think is really popular you have a ton of Lord of the Rings fans on there you have a ton of people who um Pratchett you know things like that and and so I think that there's some crossover there. There's definitely crossover for science fiction. Red Rising was a brilliant, Pierce Brown was amazing in this, in that he published this crossover gem that YA readers latched onto because the main character was, uh, I believe, 18, 17 or 18. So YA readers said, no, this is a YA book. An adult reader said, what are you talking about? This is not yours, this is ours and everybody read it. So um, the books that can do that, that can kind of be liminal and cross those lines, I think would be fabulous. All right, well, I'm just gonna ask a couple more questions because we've had you about an hour here. I think a lot of folks who are listening might be wondering, uh, was there any way you could gauge like how effective this actually was when it came to selling books? Because it is a lot of time and, for some, you know, for some people that don't have as many resources, uh, probably an investment of money too. Yes. So do you know, <laughs> I know there's no affiliate links or that you could, yeah. use it, but what, what do you think? So I think a big part of this is actually the fact that I didn't run AMS ads. I don't spend a dime in, in advertising. So the only way that I'm getting sales at this point in time is word of mouth and Instagram. That is it. I'm not spending anything on advertising. I just went into Kindle Unlimited last night to dip my toes in. That's another thing I should say is I launched wide. But overall, all the sales and all the success that I've had is because I started this cold with the launch box. Um, I'm going to be honest. I did Facebook ads for maybe a week and a half, two weeks, and I sold a certain number of books. And then I shut those off and I tried AMS ads, strictly AMS ads to see the data on that. I sold a certain amount of books. I shut them both off. I sold the same amount of books. So um, I'm not the person to talk to you about those, those marketing uh, tools. Uh, I'm just not. I have relied entirely on Instagram. So that is my forte. As far as success goes, I've been very happy with it. Uh, I sell a couple hundred copies a month. And for me, being a no-name author, that's another thing that I, I will caveat this with is six, I see this as a success because A, my launch was paid for. Um, I posted the boxes on a Friday and by Saturday I was sold out and my entire launch was paid for. So I didn't spend a dime doing this launch. And that, again, going back to the two goals that I had I want to have a spectacular launch and I want to not pay for it because who wants to pay money for that? So in my mind, it's, it's a success. I'm not out there selling 4,000 copies like some other people, but I think that we get blindsided by that in the YA world about being that big smash hit. And again, I'm very patient. I'm playing the long game. And so far it's working out very well. I, I have a really strong core of ARC readers that loved the first book. I'm, I have incredible reviews on Goodreads as far as the rating goes. I've got, now I've got that tribe of people on my author Instagram that are really dedicated to promoting me. I've got readers who are buying books for other readers to try to get my name out there and have people say, you know, I read this book and now you have to read this too. And, and that pays for itself. I mean, once you have those relationships, for me, that makes the launch an entire success. Absolutely. So. Uh, like my last question, first off, uh, do you have any other cool swag you'd like to show off? Um, 
<laughs> just wanted to make sure because if you keep I on coming up with new toys and stuff and then we just I know. Out. I do um <laughs> I don't have any here. I've done wax tarts. Oh. I've done mini candles. I I've done earrings. I've done uh the magnetic bookmarks. Artwork is great. Tote bags. I do tote bags. Okay. Neat. Uh, all um, right. Yeah, it's just, it varies. If you have a question at the end of this podcast okay. or you want to get in touch and, and ask questions, if, if a listener does or wants to bounce ideas, I'll do my best to give you my honest opinion about swag. Cool, so, excellent. Right and uh, so, uh, like, I know that a lot of people, when they think about swag, they think about stuff that's print on demand, like, you know, cafe press style t-shirts and stuff. You think that, does that have any of the same impact or just sort of the, the homemade or special, like rare type stuff really carry most of the punch? Oh, I absolutely think that if you have a following, if you have a really strong following, um, Society6 is actually, that and Instagram are really big as far as where people get their bookish merchandise. So, so, excuse me, so, Society6 does that print on demand. You don't carry a lot of inventory. Um, and readers, again, the, the bookstagrammers are already conditioned to going and hunting and digging through Society6. So that might be something that you, that you take a look at. So speaking about swag, which service do you use to create your swag? So I do the magnetic bookmarks at home with a precision cutter, a precision craft cutter called a silhouette machine. It's, you can get them on sale for about $120. And if this is a YA swag that you really want to get into and have available and do on demand in your own office, it's a super low investment um, for someone who really wants to be swag heavy as uh, compared to other things like buying a lot of inventory that could cost you six, $700. So I know that for a lot of people, $120, that is a barrier, but it can be more affordable to do that than other things. Um, for the printing that I do, I do all of my paper printing through uprinting.com. That's been a fabulous service. They have great customer service. I've I don't think I've ever had, a, I think I, I might have had one issue where they printed something upside down on the back and that was resolved overnight. They shipped it to me in no time. The big one that everybody always asks me and I rave about this company and it's been rated, I think I saw on their website the other day that it's been rated one of the top new startups in 2017 or 2016. This box, the full custom shipping box is, um, Packlane.com. So be sure to measure your book. If, especially if you're doing a hardback, you want to measure the cover clearance. This box is a six by nine by four or five, depending on what swag you do. And that fits a five by five and a half by eight and a half hardback from Ingram perfectly. It slides right in. So I'll probably have to do a follow-up uh, YouTube video myself to actually walk people through some of the dimensions and some of the protective things that go along with this. Cause it, it, it is very involved. And I would, I would say that, you know, for someone thinking about this, be prepared to spend some time really getting this together. What was that pack lane? Like P -A yes, pack lane. Mm -hmm. P -A -C -K -L -A .com. Okay, <laughs> In the show notes for folks. <laughs> I think we're episode 191 here. So if anybody comes by the site looking, I will link to the site you've mentioned and of course your site and your book. Would you like to uh, remind everyone where they can find you online and, and the name of your book? Yeah. So um, my physical copies are, you know, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, and then my ebook is as of last night in Kindle Unlimited. And I'm dipping my toes into that because again, I'm, I'm a, I'm still a new author. I'm learning just as much as everybody else listening to this podcast. I'm not somebody who has the, the magic secret for all of it. I've just played uh, to something that I personally felt comfortable with and something that I knew my strengths in. If you know uh, Facebook ads and AMS ads, hit me up because uh, I need some work in those. But overall, um, yeah, Amazon right now, and it's been great. It's been a really all fun right. journey. Cool. And I, I think you're doing great. I would not even worry about the Facebook and Amazon ads until you have more books out. It's a series, right? Yes. Yeah, like there's, there's gonna, right now, I think there's going to be four. So. 
Yeah, nice. it, it just it, those become a lot easier once you can afford to lose money on that first one because you yeah. know you're going to sell more. So that's another reason I did the launch box. Everybody sells you tells you uh, don't dump a lot of money advertising your first book. So this was again a way for me to really get that marketing punch without losing a lot in ads when I don't have the buy through. So I got the buy now, as I call it. <laughs> I didn't get the buy through, but I got the buy now, and it covered my launch. So that was that was it. Nice. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I think uh, we have had you for an over, over an hour here, so we better let you go. And uh, like I said, I'll put the links to your site and the resources you mentioned, uprinting.com, packlane.com, Society6 in the show notes, in case anybody wants to uh, follow in your footsteps there. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for all the information on Instagram. You are so first I love talking about this stuff, so, you know. Yeah, uh, we awesome. appreciate the info. Yeah. All right. And well, thanks, thanks for, for listening, everyone. Me. So long, everybody. Ciao.